thank you, everyone. Um, but, like, I'm very grateful to be here and to speak with all of you, so thank you very much for that. Um, I just want to quickly frame this paper as saying that this was a problem I found myself coming up against again and again all the way through my PhD, and it just annoyed me for years on end. Um, and when I first came across it, I sort of in my academic naivety when I'm going to solve this problem. Um, and I think that all of us at some point have gone, yeah, this is a problem I can definitively solve. Uh, needless to say, that's just not what happens. Um, so I'm presenting this paper as a solution, uh, note the indefinite article, not the definite article. Um, and I will be sharing my code throughout um, in the hopes that um, someone here might find it interesting and might find that it also solves a problem they've been coming up across. Um, so on the 3rd of March, 1541, only seven months after the execution of Thomas Cromwell, Chief Minister to the Tudor Court in the 1530s, Ambassador Charles de Marillac reported back to France that Henry VIII had been blaming his advisers for the loss of his Cromwell, complaining that, upon light pretext and by false accusations, they made him put to death the most faithful servant he ever had. This now infamous elegy of the fallen minister peppers biographical accounts of Cromwell, but why did Henry VIII lament the loss of his minister so much? Although the English king was a notoriously temperamental and fickle master, especially in his final years, as his health, uh, both physical and mental, declined, uh, the absence of Cromwell resulted in very real governmental and administrative problems at the Tudor court. Cromwell's role and power at court was built on his administrative efficiency and access to critical information to aid his king, both managed through his own personal correspondence and web of contacts. When Cromwell was removed from power, these avenues of access were disrupted and many of these correspondents were cut off. Without this bounty of extra contacts placed at Henry's disposal by Cromwell, the king mourned more than just the loss of the minister himself, but all the extra information and administrative control that Cromwell brought with him. So in network terms, Cromwell was effectively a cut point. A node that, when removed, separates one component of the network into two or more distinct components, disconnecting one part of the network from another. Identifying cut points offers a means of highlighting key members in a network structure, actors that link together disparate sections of a graph, and act as bridges for communication and information. The role of and possible problems in using cut points as a proxy for important nodes in a network has been best explored by Stephen Borgatti in his paper, The Key Player Problem, where he suggests that cut points are the most obvious means of identifying actors that would maximally disrupt communication, one of his two categories of key players. So whilst identifying cut points has become a well-practiced aspect of network analysis, there still remains questions over ranking these nodes and how to quantify or measure the impact of their removal on their network. In what ways and to what extent does a cut point fragment or disrupt a network? Though Borgatti's paper developed equations for measuring cut point fragmentation, um, which is very useful if you speak equations, um, but for many of us from the straight humanities to the histories who don't speak equation, um, this can be a little more difficult to follow. Um, and using Network X, so the Python coding library for, uh, for network analysis, cut points are returned as a list. So they merely identify whether the node separates elements of a component or not, and does not measure the extent of this fragmentation. So either by number of nodes separated or the size of the new components created. Actors are therefore selected as cut points if they disconnect one node or 100. So this paper today uh, seeks to develop Borgatti's equations into adaptable and reusable code designed to rank and evaluate the cut points in a way that is accessible to more novice coders and applicable to case studies in the digital humanities. In doing so, this builds on pre-existing packages and ideas rather than creating something brand new from scratch. Um, and as Dan Edelstein argued in a recent RHS uh, roundtable on digital historical research, there's actually not always a need to create new tools or software, but in fact to better utilize that which already exists. Or as he put it, sometimes we don't need the Bentley, we can take the Skoda and it will do the job just fine. So taking this approach um, as another way of thinking about collaboration as opportunity not only allows others to more quickly access and utilize it should they want to, uh, but it also allows us here today to spend a bit more time talking about the results and their implications for wider, um, wider digital and historical studies.
So having already qualitatively identified Thomas Cromwell as a cut point, we will apply these measures to an accessory network of the Tudor court between 1534 and 1540, so Cromwell's peak time in power, uh, using metadata collected and cleaned by Ruth and Sebastian Arna as part of their project Tudor Networks of Power. And we'll use this as an example of how these experiments can be used as part of a real historical case study. So uh, creating methodologies, but applying them and showing hopefully how they can benefit narratives. So this code then, uh, which can be found via the QR code uh, on the screen, and that will be on the rest of the slides as well, it ranks the cut points selected by the pre-existing network X function in three key measurements. Uh, F1, the first measure of fragmentation, counts the total number of components existing after the removal of a cut point. F2, the second fragmentation measure, determines the size of the largest or giant component to determine how many nodes are lost when a cut point is removed. And though we won't touch on it um, explicitly today, it also establishes the size of the second largest component. And so we can see uh, how this compares to the original graph. And finally, D considers a node's removal in terms of disruption rather than disconnection, as the first two do, uh, measuring the average path length of the giant component after a cut point's removal. So whilst Borgatti included disruption alongside fragmentation for his assessment of key players, it is important to note that these measurements are quantifying two very distinctive characteristics. Uh, though D does not consider the damage done by completely separating nodes in the network, and therefore it's not a primary measure of a cut point, uh, measuring the new average path is a means of considering the overall impact of a cut point's removal on the surviving structure. In doing so, it moves beyond basic understandings of these cut points as merely cutting and demonstrates how these measures offer greater understanding not only of individual actors, but the structures around them as well. So for each of the 301 cut points in this epistolary network, a test graph was created in which the cut point was removed, the network reconstructed, and each of the measurements calculated. The results were then assigned to the cut point as a sort of score, which could then be sorted and ranked. And in these experiments, if two cut points received the same score in any measurement, they were assigned to the same rank as one another. And this is important for some of the comparison measures we'll come back to you in a moment. This was then returned as a set of dictionaries, which were output as a full CSV, which will allow a researcher to focus on measures in the context of and in comparison to one another, as I'll shortly show. Importantly, assessing the cut points in this way allows us to identify what I have rather ineloquently termed not cuts, uh, nodes that technically are cut points, but that they isolate um, and, and what, in that they isolate other actors and do create new components, but they do have a minimal impact. One of the fundamental problems with the basic cut point list function that I mentioned earlier. Whilst this is not necessarily a problem with smaller data sets with a smaller number of cut points, which you can work through manually, it is worth being able to draw a line between greater and smaller impacts in larger networks. And this portion of the code can be changed to manage what qualifies as a significant impact for each research question. So for the moment, I have left the not cuts in there as context, um, but they can be isolated for more specific research purposes. So having returned these experiments as a CSV containing both the raw score and rank for each measure, we can begin to compare them against one another. Considering them in such a way allows us to consider this idea of importance or destruction in more nuanced ways and understand the impact of cut points when they're removed more fully. So firstly, the two fragmentation measures appear to return similar results, as can be shown by their proximity to the line of similarity on this graph, which indicates where a node holds the same rank in both measures. To a great extent, this is not at all that surprising. Uh, other quantitative measurements in network analysis tend to correlate, implying that having power or importance in one form normally draws influence in others in a kind of self-fulfilling and socially reinforcing manner. So we might expect that these fragmentations would follow a similar pattern. For this data set, the giant component contains the core of Henry VIII's court and political connections, including the king himself, key advisers and their allies, and members and monarchs of other 16th century European courts. High-ranking cut points within this network are likely to hold large sway in court business then, given that they also have an ability to severely disrupt business by fragmenting the structure. As a result, it's unsurprising that these include five European monarchs, so Henry VIII, James V, Charles V, uh, Mary of Guise, and Francis I, and other key administrators or administrative offices, which most importantly for this case study includes Thomas Cromwell, um, who rank high in these fragmentation experiments. 
They not only reflect historically influential actors, but also indicate that these nodes are most responsible for bringing and holding together parts of the network. The nodes that are isolated by these cut points removal are most likely petitioners seeking patronage or other aid from influential ministers and monarchs. As can be seen by this cluster of nodes at the bottom corner, most of the top ranking nodes hold similar ranks for both measures, indicating that these are the most impactful cut points, not only separating nodes from the giant component, but fragmenting and causing a disconnect between these removed nodes as well. As such, they are removing the maximal number of nodes at the same time as creating the maximal number of new components within the results possible for, this, for, these cut, uh, for the cut points in the network. So there are, however, other actors that are not close to this line of similarity, appearing either above or below it. Those above the line, so those that are scoring higher in the number of new components that they create, rather than the total damage they do to the main uh, component, are often not a part of the original giant component to start with, but are likely to be leaders or key brokers within smaller subgroups in, in this data set or in the archives. Indeed, nodes above the trend line in this data set are often isolated groups of correspondence that appear in the state papers by accidental preservation or other reasons, such as the case of Jehan Lange, which is the node I've circled, not that that makes much of a difference, um, it's not a picture of him, uh, whose letters survive because of interception. Um, Lange was a French merchant and broker from Paris, visiting the court in 1537, meeting with the king and facilitating the sale of goods. He wrote only to his family, friends, and fellow merchants at home in France, and therefore Lange is not only completely disconnected from the giant component, but also solely responsible for the presence of his correspondence in the state papers archives. As such, whilst he does not impact the giant component, he creates 12 new components from each of his own correspondence. So nodes above the trend line offer instances for further case studies into anomalous additions into the state papers. The second type of outlier is those nodes that sit below the trend line, with a higher ranking in F2 than in F1. These nodes, whilst isolating a greater number of nodes from the giant component, do not create a correlating amount of new components, isolating clusters rather than just individuals. Unlike the monarchs and patrons listed who are corresponding with individuals looking for personal favour, this second group of outliers are more likely to be leaders of cohesive groups who rely on the cut point to represent them in corresponding with the rest of the network. One of uh, perhaps the most recognisable of these is Robert Ask. One of the leaders of the Pilgrimage of Grace Rebellion in 1536, Ask was elected by the rebels to treat with the king in London, and correspondence was regularly passed between the court and Ask as a representative and negotiator. Correspondence was also shared within the group ASK was leading, however, meaning that they remain in smaller class clusters when ASK is removed. Whilst creating only four new components, ASK's removal uh, separates 11 nodes in total from the main component. So ranking these cut points based on the fragmentation measures offers a means to immediately identify those with the greatest impact, but comparing the said measures alongside each other allows us to examine more specific more specific structural roles within the network and how their removal affects communication and connection. Given the fair degree of similarity between rankings and the fragmentation measures, we can then use just one of these to now compare with the disruption measure D. Interestingly, there is also almost no correlation between the cut points fragmentation and disruption ranks, with only a handful lying even remotely close to the line of similarity shown here once again. The comparisons between these two measures are more revealing and more interesting, however, when we compare the fragmentation ranks to the raw score, i.e. the new average pass length, which also highlights the value of returning a node's rank and raw score when we run these experiments. On this graph, rather than a line of similarity, this line indicates the original pass length of the original graph. Those sitting on the line itself are those that are not actually part of the giant component and therefore not impacting the path length at all, like Jehan Lange. Um, and others close to this line, though ranking somewhere in the middle of the measure, are actually making a minimal disruptive impact. For the most part, these measures actually follow a loose bell curve distribution, where those to the left are actually returning an average path that is shorter than the original, and where a good number of nodes with high fragmentation ranking, such as important English administrators and European monarchs, including Henry himself, cluster close to the graph's point of origin. In these instances, whilst these cut points are responsible for connecting a large number of nodes to the giant component, when these actors are lost to the when these actors are lost, the overall diameter of the network itself is reduced, meaning that the average path length is also lessened when the maximum distance across the network is shortened. 
This tells us much about the role of cut points in a structure. Whilst high-ranking fragmentation cut points isolate a large number of neighbors, they are often on the edge of a network, or if they are part of the internal structure, are redundant there. That is to say, another member of the network can act as an alternative for their connections. In contrast, some high-ranking disruption nodes may only disconnect a minimal number of nodes, but are more critical to internal connections. As such, whilst this paper focuses only on these measurements on the identified cut points, the most disruptive node might not actually be a cut point at all. This is not to say that disruption and fragmentation measures always rank in opposition to each other, but rather that they are considering two different qualities. Of course, there are those that rank highly in all three measures. In fact, I had to remove Cromwell from this graph in order for us to see the other scores properly. And when we put him back in, we see that his removal actually causes the average path to lengthen by almost one, which it doesn't sound a lot, but it is a significant change to the internal workings of the network, considering that his removal also isolates a large number of nodes on the periphery of the graph as well. So arguably, according to these measures, Cromwell was of greater value to the internal operations of the English court in the 1530s than the king was, which is you know, a scandal. Um, so whilst this paper presents fragmentation and disruption as two distinct measures, it is worth noting, as Mark Newman et al. argue, that beyond a certain point, disruption can become destruction. This is to say that a path longer than a certain number of nodes is in fact infeasible and should be considered a destroyed path rather than just a disrupted one. So it therefore, in, um, as such, it may be suggested that cut points which disrupt a path to such an extent, making it so long that it is in fact infeasible, should have disruptions instead encountered as fragmentations. So whilst this is possible to compute, uh, deciding on a maximum usable path length and removing any paths that are, no, that are longer than this after a cut point's removal, the bigger issue is in fact deciding on what qualifies as destroyed or merely disrupted. To decide this, a limit on effort required to travel a path must be assigned to a network. How much effort one is willing to put into reaching another member of the network is likely to differ node to node, let alone network to network, and as such it can't be given sort of an arbitrary measure or limit. Um, so it's worth saying at this point that I would welcome any thoughts or suggestions as how one might dis uh, measure this move between disruption and destruction, um, whilst acknowledging that it's one of the more perpetually frustrating elements of digital history, trying to assign quantitative measurements to human agency or actions. So these measures hold value in evaluating the impact of a cut point in a number of ways, beyond simply establishing a state of basic fragmentation as the original function does. But it's also worth establishing whether these measures hold a unique value. That is to say, do these cut point measurements offer any new insights into a network, or can a pre-existing centrality measurement be used as a proxy for assessing cut point impact? For example, given that between this measures, the frequency with which a node is used on paths and cut points are the only connection on a path between at least one node and the rest of the network, we may expect between this to be able to accurately predict high ranking cut points. So to, des to test this, I compared the rankings from the first rank presentation measure to three key centrality measures, of course between this, but also degree and eigenvector. Unsurprisingly, between this is the closest, but it's still not fully accurate. There is only a 90% match between those appearing in the top 20 of between this and top 20 of the fragmentation measure, of which only eight hold the exact same ranking. Um, and this clearly becomes less as we move further away from the highest rankings. This is less than in the other, this is less in the other centralities too. An 85% similarity in the top 20 for degree and 60% for eigenvector. In fact, two of the top 20 ranked eigenvector nodes are not cut points at all, suggesting this measure is the least able to predict cut points with high fragmentation scores. Though these centrality measurements, especially between this, can roughly estimate cut points and their impact, this is not perfect, and therefore developing this new process for ranking cut points is still a useful act, which was a pleasant discovery. Um, but this disparity is even starker when we compare these centralities to this disruption measure in this code. Here, the top 20 for each centrality has only a similarity of 15 to 20%, again suggesting that these are vastly different measures. Again, this, rep this reflects the comparison with fragmentations that I established earlier, but it's important to note the ways that traditional and pre-existing measures are fundamentally unable to replicate these new cut point measurements. Well, I say fundamentally unable to replicate, but in each of these measures, the number one ranking node for degree between us and eigenvector matches the number one rank for disruption, and in fact, the number one rank for, for both fragmentation measures. 
it becomes, uh, perhaps comes as no surprise to Tudor historians, or indeed members of the Tudor court, that Thomas Cromwell himself indeed tops the table for each of these rankings, coming in as both the destructive and disruptive cut point in the network. Though in many ways these measures allow us to assess traditional but contested accounts of the chief minister as the unifying factor of the Tudor court, in itself a valid and sometimes overlooked act of the digital humanities, validating that which we already know, it also offers a better understanding of his role in the epistolary structure and the potential impact of his removal, introducing more complex and interesting layers to the cut point construct. And indeed, whilst we may already know some of these things about Cromwell, using these methods allows us to identify potential unknown points of interest, not only in this network, but in other ones as well. By offering this adaptable and reusable code to the research community, uh, in a way that only requires someone to slot in a CSV and run it if they just don't want to make any more changes beyond that, I hope not only to have reflected on collaboration as opportunity by considering connections and collaboration across communication structures, but also by demonstrating the collaborative process of the digital humanities as a whole and fostering new angles in digital network analysis for historical inquiry. Thanks very much.